usually you know why you get asked to give talks. Uh, so when I got an email saying, well, oh, I've got to give a talk on this, I, I was surprised. Um, it's not that I don't deal with them. My mind was immediately taken back to this lady who I inherited when I became a consultant in 1990. Philip Clark had, had dealt with most of his waiting list pretty effectively, so I didn't have very much to, to do that was worrying or dangerous. But this lady was on the ward as I was appointed. She was 48, she was a BMI of uh, 45, type 2 diabetic, uh, multiple sclerosis, wheelchair bound, and incontinent. Um, she'd been incontinent in the community, and the community services, to their credit, perhaps not, uh, had been managing with the urethral catheter, and when the catheter was expelled because of the bladder spasms, they put in a bigger catheter with a bigger balloon, until that got expelled, to such a situation that a, a 25 mil balloon was coming out three times a day, at which point they said she can't control her incontinence, and they sent her in with a, a pressure sore on her bottom, and asked us to sort it out. And indeed, when uh, we looked down below, I could get four fingers in through her urethra, where the catheter balloon had been coming out. So when I... Anticholinergics anti made no difference at all. At that stage, we only had oxybutynin, but it made no difference. I put a suprapubic catheter in, and that was uh, no value whatsoever. Uh, and I tried, because of her weight, on a spinal anaesthetic, I tried to do a urethral closure. Um, never having done one before, which is the sort of thing you did in 1993 when you were a newly appointed consultant. Uh, and that didn't work either. Um, so the question is, what do you do next? Well, you won't find out the answer to that unless you sit through to the end of my talk. Uh, but she, that lady is imprinted on my brain for reasons that will become clear. What I'm going to talk about a little bit is about definitions and prevalence in relation to obesity. Uh, talk about the anaesthetic considerations, because actually... I think this is far more relevant to an anaesthetic audience than it is to a surgical audience. Uh, talk a little bit about outcomes in obese patients and touch upon politics, which I think is the real reason I was asked to talk about uh, this particular topic. Those are the definitions. You'll probably be all be familiar with that. Uh, anything over 30 BMI is considered obese. Uh, morbid obesity is over 35, and so I find out you've got something called super morbid obesity, which is a BMI over 55. Uh, and in terms of global prevalence, by and large, it's a problem of the developed world. Although you can see there, there are some centres uh, or some countries of, of high prevalence in the Middle East, uh, which is interesting. And again, that's paralleled by the amount of uh, type 2 diabetes associated with it. We are the fat man of Europe. We are fatter than just about everybody. Uh, although, you know, Turkey, uh, perhaps if you call it Turkey being Europe... Uh, is with us. Uh, Switzerland is also high, um, but we're in a situation, that's 2014 data, is still, still going up. And, uh, and so 25, 30% of the adult population of the UK would be classified as being obese. I think it's important to remember that, uh, that BMI isn't necessarily the best measure of obesity. Uh, waist circumference is actually better because it measures central obesity and that's it's the central fat as I'll talk to you a little bit in, in a minute or two it is the more dangerous bit of fat. It's the bit that's metabolically active and is the, the, the bit of fat that gives rise to the metabolic syndrome and all the cardiovascular consequences that go with it. And, 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 and broadly speaking, there are two types of obesity. You've got what's called an android, which is the central obesity, typically but not universally in men, and so-called gynecoid obesity, which is more around the hips and buttocks, uh, which is more typically, but not again, not universally, a female uh, problem. And if you think about it from a surgical perspective, actually those two different fat distributions give you different challenges. Uh, the central obesity is often intra-abdominal, uh, the, the gynecoid obesity is extra, is usually extra peritoneal, although not, again, there's, there's, a, there's a crossover between the two. Uh, and you can look at it in a different way, the CT scan, where you can highlight uh, the, the intra-peritoneal fat on the far side, the, the extra abdominal fat in the middle, and all the fat uh, on this side of the slide. And they give a surgeon, a reconstructive surgeon, different challenges as according to the location of the fat. 
As I've suggested, it's the central fat which is metabolically active, and this is the sort of cartoon that describes what happens. Uh, the fat leads to systemic hyperinsulinemia, uh, to insulin resistance, and is often associated with type 2 diabetes. So if we, with that background, if we move on to the uh, the anaesthetic uh, considerations. I think the first thing to say is that there are lots of comorbidities. Uh, the obese patient often has diabetes, often has a history of cardiovascular disease, often has obstructive sleep apnea, often has arthritis. They are at greater risk of a variety of different cancers. Uh, and they are therefore the classic comorbid patient which are increasingly populating our, our clinics and our waiting lists. And from an anaesthetic perspective, there are a number of things. The, the, the fat causes an increased metabolic rate, so you get increased oxygen consumption, increased CO2 production. You get a fat chest wall, so the chest wall is less compliant. It is more difficult to ventilate. As I'll talk to you in a, in a minute, the blood volume goes up because you get a polycythemia. And so the pulmonary compliance becomes greater, it becomes more, less stretchy. Uh, you get, a, as a consequence of those two things, you get a reduction in functional re residual capacity, so the, res the ventilatory reserve, the anaesthetist, is diminished. Uh, uh, and you also, as a consequence, get a VQ mismatch because of that. Interestingly, you also get a, a CO2 insensitivity, so you don't get an increased respiration rate to increasing CO2 in the same way that would be normal physiology. And then you give them an anaesthetic. That's all before you give them an anaesthetic. Then you give them an anaesthetic, which makes it all worse. Because the anaesthesia makes it worse. The position makes it worse. I'm not going to talk particularly about laparoscopy. But if any of you do laparoscopy, those positive pressures inside the abdomen also cause greater difficulty with breathing. breathing, breathing. So they are a hypoxic at rest. They are more likely to desaturate. They are more likely to collapse their alveoli. So perioperatively, there's far more respiratory-wise that can go wrong. Obstructive sleep apnea probably bears uh, a little bit further discussion. It's due to excessive deposition uh, of fat around the larynx, such that actually the larynx just closes. Uh, that leads to snoring, it leads to hypoxia, and it leads to hypercapnia. And it's present in significant proportions of obese patients, 40 to 90% according to, to, to the literature. In terms of cardiovascular risk, you're in, you're, the, the blood volume goes up uh, as a consequence of polycythemia, as a consequence of abnormalities of the renin angiotensin system. And that puts the heart under more pressure. The cardiac output has to go up, the ventricular contractility has to increase, and a fat patient is far more likely to be hypertensive. So you put all that together, and they're far more likely to get heart failure. So when the anaesthetist has to see the patient, they have to deal with a number of issues. They will have to manage the diabetes perioperatively. They will have to deal with an increased risk of gastroesophageal reflux. They will have to deal with the fact that all that fat deals with anaesthetic agents rather differently. The dosing is very different according to the anaesthetic agents that get absorbed within the fat. In principle, operations should be better done under regional anaesthetic, but in practice... It's difficult because you lose the bony landmarks and actually getting a needle in the right place in somebody who's very fit isn't always the easiest thing to do. You need to use analgesic mixtures that are non-sedating, uh, again for the respiratory reasons I've talked about, and they have an increased thromboembolic risk. Uh, the anaesthetist would like to position them with their head up. If you're doing any intra-abdominal surgery and you want to deal with intestine, you often want the head down. So there is a balance to be, to be met uh, for the uh, for the surgeon and the anaesthetist. And although we often think that they have difficulty getting a tube down in a fat patient, actually it's not, it, it isn't particularly the difficulty, it's the ventilation side of it which is the difficulty. You can see simply having them on the table that you need in, enough people to move them. You need to be able to get close enough to them to do the operation. Uh, and life can be challenging. Post-operatively, uh, ideally the anaesthetist would wish to extubate them wide awake, ideally sat up. Uh, and post-operative nursing care should ideally be in critical care if they've got any significant comorbidities. And those are the anaesthetic guidelines. If it's minor surgery, no comorbidity going back to the ward is probably okay. If it's major surgery or significant comorbidities, they ought to have some sort of uh, level 2 or level 3 uh, support. They may need CPAP. 
uh, if they've got obstructive sleep apnea, and they will ideally need a cocktail of drugs to ideally provide analgesia with as little sedation as possible. They need early chest physiotherapy and early mobilisation. So if, you've, that, if, if the anaesthetist has got their bit, well, what, what about the surgical bits? Well, I can't emphasise the very first bit altogether. If you've got somebody who's morbidly obese who comes to see you in the clinic, try not to operate on them. Try to really go through with them uh, what the options are, particularly in the context of the Montgomery ruling, the process of consent in this group of patients is, I think, really very challenging to get it right and to get the right uh, procedure done for the individual. If you do get forced into doing an operation or have to do an operation for whatever reason, make sure that you're going to have adequate exposure surgically. Give yourself enough time in the operating theatre. It is going to take you longer to do the operation. It's going to take the anaesthetist longer to anaesthetise them. And you will need assistance. It's interesting, in the past year in our unit, we now regularly operate without any assistance. You can't do these cases without highly... without one, two, or, or three so good assistants um, with experience. You need to be able to get to the patient. Uh, you need to be able to see inside the patient. So if the fat is in the abdominal wall, you've often got a, a, quite a deep abdominal incision before you get to the peritoneal cavity. If the fat is centrally, then you end up with mesentery, which is thickened, where the bowel is less mobile. Uh, and where mobilisation of bits of bowel around, for instance, with an ileal conduit, is a lot more, a lot more challenging. And remember that just because they look big on the outside doesn't mean that they're always big on the inside. They may still have a relatively small pelvis, uh, and indeed there's, there's increasing ev there is evidence in colorectal surgery uh, that often these people, because of the fat deposition in the pelvis, have mobilisation uh, and anastomotic difficulties for the colorectal surgeons within the pelvis. And then you've got the problem of where you're going to put the stoma. Because that's a challenge. That was the, became a challenge with my lady. Uh, because when they lie down, they're in one position. When they stand up, they're in a different position. All the fat drops. Uh, is the first problem. The second problem is the patient can't see the bottom part of their abdomen. So you often end up having to cite an ileal conduit, if that's what you've got to do, where it's visible, where there's no creases to be seen. And you end up usually in the upper abdomen, where actually the, the abdominal wall fat is usually thinner than the... Uh, than it is lower down the abdomen. So uh, good stoma placement, good liaison with your stoma team is important if you, if you get involved with these cases. You'd love to get a stoma like that, wouldn't you? Uh, but in fact, the reality is in some of these patients, it's very difficult to, to do because the mesentery is thickened. Uh, the, the layer of adipose tissue in the abdominal wall uh, means you've got a challenge. So what can you do? Well, you can use longer bowel segments. I think that's something I would regularly do. Uh, you certainly have to be prepared to mobilise the small intestine uh, more fully. Uh, I've, on a couple of occasions, I've found it very difficult to get the small bowel anywhere near the abdominal wall for the appropriate site, and I've used a colonic uh, conduit. Uh, you have to make a bigger hole in the abdominal wall, and it's reported, and I've never done it myself, that you can do a two-stage, as you're pulling the stoma out through the abdominal wall, you can pull it out in three stages. Through, if you mobilise across the rectus sheath underneath the fat, you can pull it out part way before taking it out through the fatty segment of the abdominal wall. I've never done that, but it is, it, it is reported. So what can go wrong? Well, just about everything can go wrong because you often end up with a stoma which is less than spouted, so it, it can leak. You can often get uh, urinary leakage from the, the from stoma site and you are far more likely to get stomal necrosis with accompanying retraction uh, and, and parastoma and, 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 and stenosis of the, the stoma thereafter. And the incidence of parastomal hernia in, in obese patients is substantially higher, so there's a lot more things that can go wrong. If you're doing a more complex reconstruction, a cystoplasty or some sort, to find fat of that sort of layer, thick uh, mesenteric fat, you're, you're, you're filled with dread and horror because the, the mobilisation for the bowel, the, the detubularisation, the creation of pouches, they're getting it down to the pelvis perhaps onto a urethral stump if you're doing a bladder reconstruction. Uh, it's a lot more difficult. And so what's, what are the solutions? Try not to do it. Try to avoid the surgery if possible. Uh, but you've got to be prepared to do extra mobilisation or use different bowel segments and using colon would be something that I would, would, would jump to because it often has less, meson less fat in the mesentery than the small bowel. So what about outcomes? Well, there is good evidence 
that if you do in intestinal surgery in obese patients, you'll have longer operating times, you'll have a greater incidence of uh, surgical site infection, uh, you'll have a significantly increased risk of stomal complications. Uh, the evidence about anastomotic leak is limited. The, the, there are mixed evidence in both directions. And again, there's mixed evidence about the risk of uh, wound dehiscence. But the operation has more that can go wrong. In terms of perioperative morbidity, this is a series of patients going through a single North American institution where they looked at the mortality and the need for ICU uh, admission uh, by BMI. Uh, and you can see that BMI places a significant risk of mortality uh, on patients. And these, this is something that patients should know about if you're ever persuaded uh, to operate on them. And it really is a central part of the, the informed consent process. So moving on to, th I suspect the reason I was really asked to, to talk about is, is what should we do with stress incontinence surgery? Stress incontinence surgery is perhaps the classic elective care pathway within urology. And as many of you will know, elective care services in the UK are under some pressure. So the question is, is there any benefit in patients losing weight preoperatively? Uh, does being overweight affect the results of surgery? Uh, and what should you be doing for stress urinary incontinence surgery in patients with ladies with morbid obesity? And I, this is the reason uh, that I'm here, I suspect, is that last autumn, uh, a number of CCGs around the country started banning patients from accessing elective care pathways uh, by, by reason of their weight or their smoking. This was Harrogate, but it was lots of CCGs across the north of England, quite a lot in the southeast. Uh, and because of my role at the college, I found my name on the front page of the, of the Telegraph uh, one morning with my name next to that, that statement. And indeed, it, would, it made quite a lot of news, that's the BBC website, uh, around the same period. And the President was on BBC Breakfast morning talking about that. But it wasn't just last year, that's Kirklees CCG. Kirklees is, is a CCG in West Yorkshire, it's the Wakefield area, and that is a statement that came out last week. Uh, that's a, a, a policy from the Kirklees CCG. And they are restricting access to elective care pathway for all patients with a BMI over 30, and everybody with a BMI over 30 can't go an elective pathway unless they do 12 months of weight loss and lose weight. If you don't do that, you can't get on an elective care pathway. Now, quite frankly, it isn't stress incontinence that's the target here. It's, it's hip replacements and knee replacements that's the real target because that's the volume of the elective care pathway. Uh, but that is what's happening around the country. And if you talk to NHS England, it's quite clear that the, the elective care pathway is being deprioritized in financial terms in comparison to cancer pathways and the four hour wait in A&E. Uh, and because there's only a limited amount of money, they want to spend less money on elective surgical care as a consequence. So while the orthopods will sit in a room and say, well, you can do a hip replacement in somebody with a BMI of 35 and get just as good a result. What's the evidence about stress incontinence surgery? Well, that's what there is in the EAU guidelines. Uh, obesity is a risk factor for urinary incontinence in women. Non-surgical weight loss in obese women improves urinary incontinence, and surgical weight loss improves urinary incontinence in obese women. So there is evidence, high-level evidence, that weight loss diminishes urinary incontinence. What about somebody uh, who wants an operation, who's already on the waiting list for an operation? Well, this is a systematic review. It was published two or three years ago, and it identified 13 uh, high-quality publications and effectively found that for subjective core and objective core, obesity made no difference to outcome of uh, mid-urethral tape surgery. I was rather surprised when I found that because I intuitively thought that it was likely that you'd get, get less good results because I'd sort of brought in to the top line that the theoretical risk that obesity might put additional pressure on the pelvic floor and lead to less good results might be true. I'd assume that was true. And it may be that this is, this is too early data. This was pooled data at 12 months. And it may also be that in the context of a BMI greater than 30, you're not looking sensitively at actually those with morbid obesity, those ladies who actually have a BMI of 35 or 40, something like that. And indeed, there are a couple of publications where they've tried to tease that out. This was two analyses of a North American randomized trial between TVT and TOT, where they looked at outcome according to BMI. And although there's no statistics significance there, it does appear in those relatively small numbers of cases uh, that the higher the BMI, the less likely you are to get a good result from the stress incontinence surgery. 
So what about my lady, the lady uh, that I started off with, my lady with uh, multiple sclerosis, diabetes, uh, uh, a BMI of 45? Well, we ended up having to do an ileal conduit. I wish that was the conduit result I'd produced, but we did get a slightly spouted stoma in the upper abdomen, and she went to ITU electively and got off the ventilator and came back to the ward, where she got a chest infection, which became a fungal chest infection, followed by fungal septicemia and death. Uh, the lady I remember very well, rather sadly. Uh, uh, and I guess the message I would leave you with is if you've got these patients, try to avoid operating on them. Um, that's the solution, I think, for, for bariatric surgery and, and reconstructive urology is try not to operate on them. If you do, make sure you go through consent properly and fully. Uh, the perioperative care is far more important in many ways than the surgery. But from a surgical perspective, try and work out in your own mind where the fat is. Is it the abdominal wall? Is it intraperitoneal? Or is it both? And then make a plan accordingly. Uh, and if you do have to go ahead, make sure that you've got enough time, uh, enough assistance, uh, and enough exposure to do the job properly. Thank you very much.
us about Ellis Danlos patients, which I know some of us are seeing more and more frequently from a urological point of view. Thank you. Uh, in my talk, uh, I will briefly mention some of the other connective dis tissue disorders. They're actually quite rare, um, but I'll really be focusing mainly on the EDS hypermobile group. Um, so with the patients with joint hypermobility syndrome, they have an increased passive or active extension of their joints, and the joints go beyond the normal range. And I'll show you the classification mechanism, which is very easy to do in outpatients. And it's a common uh, heritable disorder uh, of the connective tissue, and it's, uh, it's actually has variable penetrance, and it's supposed to be a dominantly inherited disorder. So we would expect uh, of a parent that 50% of the children would have some element of benign joint hypermobility. Um, it's often overlooked, and um, it, it's identical to Ehlers-Danlos type 3. Uh, these are the Byton criteria, and the patients for each joint, the, for example, the little finger will be uh, flexed more than 90 degrees, the thumb goes to the forearm, that the uh, arm hyperextends at the elbow, the knees uh, overextend, and the, with their legs straight, they're able to touch their palms to the floor. So each of these would be one point, and because obviously you have two arms and two legs, it ends up as a score of nine. And if your score is greater than four out of nine, then you would be defined as having benign joint hypermobility. Um, the ex hyperextension at the elbow is greater than 15 degrees and also the, with the leg, uh, that the leg extends beyond uh, being straight. In addition, there is something called the Brighton criteria, which is that these patients also complain of joint and muscle pain for more than six months before uh, being assessed. Um, and that's a much more rigorous uh, criteria. So you think, well... It's stretchy ligaments. I can probably see that these patients might have stress incontinence because of stretchy ligaments. What do they really have? And what we find is that it's really a multi-system disorder. It not only affects their blood pressure, they also have problems with uh, allergies, with uh, slow transit constipation, problems with reflux, having, uh, they f uh, have early sensation of satiety, so if they try and eat, they can only eat small meals. They will often faint, uh, particularly if they have a carbohydrate-rich meal. Um, so they have a number of different problems, and also fibromyalgia, and there's associated depression and anxiety, and also painful bladder. That's 2013. So what, what is there in the literature about joint hypermobility? Certainly looking at children, comparing uh, 89 children with uh, joint hypermobility compared with 116 controls, and these were diagnosed with the uh, uh, Byton and Bulbina scales. In girls, there was increased daytime incontinence, 38% compared with 14% for the controls, and nighttime incontinence, 13% compared with 2% controls. But interestingly, there was also an increase in urine tract infection, 24% of them having urine tract infection compared with 11%. And I'm going to come on to that later as to why that potentially may be the case. But if we look at other types of uh, connective tissue disorder, um, there's, uh, there are a number of different, Marfan's, Williams, uh, Erlis Danlos, and uh, Cuteus Laxa. Cuteus Laxa is one person in 400,000. We're probably never going to see those patients. But all of them have increased risk of vesica ureteric reflux in children and also bladder diverticular. So there is definitely an anatomical abnormality, which we'll see, and uh, on average... Uh, obviously, these children will have a much higher risk of urine tract infection. What about adults? What do we see? What studies have there been done in adults with benign joint hypermobility? 
and this was looking at 175 women with lower urinary tract dysfunction. Um, these were all patients who presented to a clinic with urine tract symptoms. They were then assessed in terms of whether they had benign joint hypermobility, and around 26% had. So it's not that rare in your day-to-day -day clinic. And what was found was that these women had an odds ratio of uh, 1.5 that they had detrusor overactivity. So a little bit of a surprise, not stress incontinence, detrusor overactivity. And they were actually less likely to have mixed incontinence, urodynamic mixed incontinence and urodynamic stress incontinence. So something not quite right. Uh, there was another study where patients were specifically seen in a uh, joint hypermobility clinic and 30 women with uh, EDS, Biden score greater than four, compared with 30 controls. And it was found that they had double the rate of urinary incontinence. So 60% of these patients had urinary incontinence and 23% had uh, fecal incontinence. And they all had a greater impairment of their quality of life. This same group were reported in a separate study looking at prolapse. And again, there was double the rate of vaginal prolapse and they also had double the rate of sexual dysfunction. So it seems to impact on a number of different areas in the pelvis. What about uh, patient, people in uh, the uh, Joint Hypermobility Syndrome Association? So this is admittedly a selected group, self-selected group, and they had a 39% response rate. And again, very high rates of urinary incontinence around 69% compared with their controls uh, for, of 30%, and also fecal incontinence, around 15%, compared with the controls of 2%. And, but there was an association between increasing BMI and fecal incontinence. What's interesting about these patients, they aren't the tall, thin, marfanoid uh, sort of patients. They can be all s sorts of uh, sizes and weights. So um, they don't look specifically joint hypermobile unless you test their joints. And then lastly, there's a, a specialised group. It's probably about 5% of patients with joint hypermobility who end up having a problem with their blood pressure. They have postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So if they stand up too quickly, they will get a tachycardia. They quite often faint. Um, if they have a heavy meal... Uh, again, they will collapse. Um, they often come, a lot, come with very strange symptoms and symptoms all over their body. Um, and these patients have been found to have, uh, an, an, they develop an antibody to their adrenoceptor so that uh, instead of the blood pressure, the body being able to increase the blood pressure, for example, when they stand, they have to compensate by having an increase in heart rate. So they'll, they'll complain of tachycardia. Um, and these patients, out of 22 patients, they found that 20 of them had detrusor overactivity. Um, so when having video urodynamics, they're the patients on the tilt table. When you put it up, they start feeling very faint and you have to put the, the tilt table down again. Um, and interestingly, they also had painful bladders. So what, what in general is there about EDS hypermobility and LUTs in terms of what are the, what's the general picture? Obviously, I've spoken a lot about incontinence and uh, overactive bladder detrusor overactivity. It's much more common in women. Um, it may, that may only be because it's much easier to show evidence of it in women, or perhaps they present uh, to hospitals more. But they seem to divide into three groups. There are patients who have frequency and urgency, there's another group, um, and I'm afraid this is from our personal experience, of the infrequent voiders. They void two to three times a day. Um, they are the ones who ultimately have an operation or some event occurs, they stop voiding. Um, I don't know whether they're Fowler syndrome patients, but they certainly follow the pattern that eventually some of them will stop voiding and need to be self-catheterized. And then there's another group who have a painful bladder with frequency and urgency. 
when they have very severe nocturia, very severe frequency. Another thing which you'll notice about these patients when you see them in clinic is they have very marked erythema and skin rashes. Um, and the classic place where you'll see it is actually on their chest. It'll be red, and you, you say to them, oh, have you been out in the sun? Have you got um, you know, sunburn? And they'll say, well, haven't been in the sun at all. And also they have a problem with um, drinking things like wine. It'll make them feel quite unwell, or they'll get a headache with it. Um, uh, they really won't be able to tolerate alcohol very well. Um, by the way, this is the patient afterwards, once she got better. But she had terrible... Uh, erythema and rashes. What do we see on cystoscopy? Certainly with the painful bladder group, I think it, you know, whether it's, it's the same as the group you see uh, ordinarily in clinic, uh, they will have bleeding. Um, some of them will have elevated numbers of mast cells uh, using a CD117 stain. Um, a CD25 stain doesn't seem to show very much at all. Uh, but some of them will have a normal mast cell count less than 25 per square millimetre. It seems to be 50-50. So, okay, they've got some physical findings, uh, rashes, we can look at their joints, uh, they have potentially lots of other symptoms, and there have been a number of studies looking at bladder pain and overactive bladder, an association with irritable bowel, fibromyalgia, that we know that in general, when we look at overactive bladder, it's associated with other systemic issues, and also painful bladder is associated with other systemic issues. But is there anything about these patients, perhaps in terms of the bacteria in their bladder? And this is some new data about these EDS patients. Back in 1982, um, studies were done on mouse bladder where E. coli were introduced, and um, it was found that uh, if the infection was left more than 10 days, that the uh, bacteria invaded the bladder wall and uh, these, these mice uh, developed little biopods. And uh, subsequently, this has been seen in humans, that uh, some patients will actually develop, um, and here you can see in the, in the, in the top corner, uh, uh, bladder biopsy, and the purple area is actually a uh, bacterial biopod. And if we look at it under scanning electron microscopy, you can see the bacteria uh, actually embedded in the bladder. They've actually stripped off the, uh, uh, the superficial urethelium. So, okay, so there's something about patients with EDS, and they seem to get these bacterial infections which embed in their bladder, it happens much more often. And one of the ways we can look at bacteria is we can actually look at the DNA of bacteria, look at the microbiome in the bladder. We certainly, there have been studies showing that patients with uh, overactive bladder wet have more varied organisms in their uh, urine, catheter specimens of urine than controls. There's some kind of bacterial change. But when we look at the microbiome, bacteria do all sorts of things. They may cause uh, uh, pathogenic bacteria not to invade the bladder. They can invade the bladder itself. They can uh, uh, cause an inflammation. They have all sorts of things that they can do. So what do we see in patients with EDS when we look at the microbiome? And this is a study on over 90 patients uh, looking at uh, who have EDS. And these, all these patients had urgency and urgency incontinence. And what we found was that they had particular bacteria more uh, significantly more than the controls. Um, but they're bacteria which we never heard of, Priv Privatella, Bivia, Propio, Microbio, Biomium. You know, they're, they're organisms which we really never really come across. Um, but certainly, these EDS patients have increased numbers of odd bacteria. And when we looked at the patients with incontinence uh, in particular, there was significantly more Aerococcus cristensii. I, and we don't actually, you know, I, I haven't really been able to find from a microbiologist how is this organism treated. So there's something going on in terms of the bacteria 
and these EDS patients. And when we look at their vaginal and urinary microbiome, it's very linked. And, and that may well uh, be the reason that vaginal probiotics have been found to be valuable in patients who have urine tract infections. So there's something going on in terms of bacteria and the bladder, and there's something going on in terms of the immune system and these patients. And in this study with Hannon, they looked at uh, mice, and they found that mice who had E. coli infections did one of three things. One, they had a mild to moderate response. They cleared the infection. I suppose it's the patient who says, I drink lots of water, I flush my bladder out, the infection goes. There was one group who had a weak or absent response, and so the infection just persisted, but there, there was no evidence of inflammation in their bladder biopsy. And then there was a group who had a severe inflammatory response, and I presume that those are the patients who develop an inflamed and irritated bladder. So looking at the immune system in EDS patients, um, there are two types of immunity. There's an innate immune system, which are really the cells which, are, which attack as soon as an organism enters the body and certainly enters the bladder, it's a tissue-based phenomenon. It has no memory response, but the organisms end up embedded in the bladder wall. Or there's the adaptive immunity, antibodies. So obviously you have to be exposed to the infection to develop some kind of antibodies. So two types of immune response. And certainly the innate immune system is the key thing which actually uh, causes... Uh, fights off an infection. It's the sort of thing which actually causes the erythema and the redness around an incision. It basically relies on the body detecting a bacteria, virus or fungus. Um, it doesn't really know what it is, but it creates an, uh, an immune response. And one of the key parts of the innate immune system are the mast cells, which are obviously contain histamine. And obviously this has been a story going on for a long time in, in bladders. Um, and waning in terms of whether it's in favour or not. Um, and obviously they release chemicals which cause edema, swelling, redness, pain. There's another part of the immune system to do with the complement system, which is the mannose binding lectin. And it uh, actually specifically binds bacteria and then causes the complement system to be activated and then it can actually cause uh, bacteria to be destroyed by cytolysis. Um, and this is a, a very elegant uh, picture from Nature where uh, it shows the l lectin is the little black thing on the end of uh, the, um, see it's an orange thing, CD48, and then there's a black thing which is the uh, mannose binding lectin. And what it allows the white blood cells to do is to actually attach to bacteria. It sort of almost produces a stickiness for bacteria to be uh, picked up and to be internalised or destroyed. If you don't have it, you're more likely to end up with chest infections uh, and generalised infections or end up on intensive care units. But it's never really been demonstrated in, in urinary tract infections. So, what do we see in the immune system in EDS patients? There are certainly higher rates of painful bladder in women with EDS. And what's been found, and this is now a cohort of around 360 patients, that 40% of them don't have an enzyme for destroying histamine. So if, you're, if these patients' mast cells get activated, they don't destroy the histamine at all. So they'll have a much more aggressive histamine response. And going back to what the patients spoke about when they said, I can't tolerate wine, actually that's a very histaminic substance. 35% of them, oh, and in the general population, it's around 2%. So 40% is much, much higher than the general population and 35% have severely reduced mannose binding lectin. In the general population, it's about 10%. So, and those patients with EDS have recurrent infections. Remember we saw that thing about the children having recurrent infections and also the adults having recurrent infections. And it's probably because they, they, they lack this protein. So they certainly have more inflammation uh, and that, there are two ways of doing that. One would be not, be not to break down histamine, and certainly that's the thing we see in these patients with EDS, and potentially that's the reason why we see them having painful bladder. Is there any genetic stuff about these patients? 
Well, there, there's a study, this is from uh, Nature Genetics. They looked at 25 families, some of them have pay members having EDS, some of them being normal. And what they found was that uh, these patients suffered from fatigue, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, skin rashes. Certainly irritable bowel fibromyalgia has been implicated with uh, overactive bladder and detrusor of activity. Um, unfortunately, they didn't look at urinary symptoms, but they found that there was uh, evidence of raised serum tryptase levels, and also they had an increased, co more symptomatic the patient, the more they had copies of an alpha tryptase gene, which is associated with mast cells. So in conclusion, these patients have higher rates of overactive bladder uh, than controls. They also seem to have more painful bladder, when in looking at urine and bladder biopsies, they seem to have more abnormal bacteria. Obviously, we don't know what these, how these bacteria are interacting with the patients. Are they really the cause of a problem, or do they just tell us that their urethelium is disrupted? And they also have reduced diamine oxidase activity or mannose binding lectin, which can lead to increased inflammation, or on the other hand, lead, lead to recurrent urine tract infections. So they're a complex group, there's something else going on with them, and you'll probably have about 26% of them in your clinic. Thank you very much. Um, we've got several questions.
it in, for example, superpubic catheter, it's just doom. They become so unwell, and you just can't get them out of it. I, I, presume, it's, I pres presume it's a biofilm. Um, Nikesh, sorry. Nikesh, question next. Uh, and then thank you. A sim a similar thing. themed uh, question, really, that should we only see these patients after they've been through the endocrinology or your connective tissue disorder uh, medical consultant colleague before we offer them any sort of treatment? D to be honest, you'll find that your connective tissue disorder, your rheumatologist will actually send the patients to you because they'll say, I don't know what to do with these patients. You know, urologists are actually tissue specialists. This is a tissue disorder. And in a way, by being able to access the bladder, being able to biopsy the bladder, you actually can determine what's wrong with the patient. Um, and actually getting rid of the infective element or the inflammatory element in the bladder gets the rest that they then generally get better. So it's the other way around. So, so, so patients with detrusive overactivity, for example, they should all have bladder biopsies. Ah, no, right. Okay, no. In this, this, this is This in is this specifically the EDS patients. You know, by all means, one can give them uh, the usual treatment with anticholinergics or with uh, beta 3 adrenoceptor agonists. But then quite often they'll fail and they'll quite often have very severe nocturia. And then you scope them and you'll find, or do your dynamics, and you'll find that bladder capacity is small, they have pain, and when you, when you scope them, you see a very inflamed bladder, um, and, then, and then you can treat them. Final question with Tamsin. I mean, there seems to be a veritable epidemic of this at the moment, because before five years ago, I'd hardly see anyone with EDS or POTS, and now every single clinic, there's someone being referred with, with this combination, and... What's happening? Why? And what's the lottery numbers? Yeah. Shall I tell you something? You know, my, my suspicion is dietary change. I, I'm sure it's dietary change. If you, if you actually look at the foods which are, well, would come up on the list, they're all the trendy, healthy foods. Um, we, we've seen a lot of patients who've gone on an orange juice and uh, chocolate diet and uh, you know, trying to get fit and healthy with orange juice, and then they're having chocolate, and they get iller and iller and iller. But there's something about diet. I'm sure it's to do with that. This time, we'll definitely have the last question. Susie, a quick one. Sorry, I'm, I'm great talk. I'm just, I'm unclear. How strong is the genetics of this? Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it is very strong in terms of being dominantly inherited, but um, for, for example, that last, um, paper I spoke about, the Lyons paper, the actual number of copies of the gene alter between generations. So quite often when you speak to a patient, they'll talk about their grandmother being unwell, the mother not being too unwell at all, even though she has some features, but nothing which means that she goes to hospital or sees a doctor, but then the granddaughter will have the problem. So it, it gets, it, it, it's a, a dominantly inherited uh, problem but it has variable penetrance, probably because of the number of copies of the gene passed on. I suppose what I'm saying is, is, is this a real condition, or are we tying together a series of... Sorry to be a cynic. Well, uh, well uh, you know, that, that's the reason why we're just basing it on our blood tests, our genetic tests. I agree with you. You know, there's nothing worse than saying, oh, well, I can bend my joints. What, what is that? But if we can base it on tests, then I think we've got something to go on. I, I agree with you 100%. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kula. Thanks so much, Vic. Um, uh, I'm sure there is an element of awareness as well. I think we're probably becoming more and more aware of these patients. Um, so we would like to present the next speaker, who is um, Steve Foley, who is a consultant urologist at Royal Berkshire County Hospital. Um, who is going to be talking about bulking agents. As we've heard, bulking agents use it on the app. Um, and um, we will e we'll be eager to uh, listen to his talk. Uh, he has a very popular video on YouTube. And um, I'm I've sure... Got, I've got several. Uh, <laughs> you know. uh, I'm sure we've all seen it. It's a, po it's uh, a, a point of view, HD. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, Steve. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Declaration of interest, as we should do before every talk. Uh, I am obese, and uh, I'm not very bendy. 
And I'm pleased to say I haven't taken any money from anyone for doing this talk, so I can say what the fuck I like. Um, and they will obviously put some bleeps in as we go along. Um, I think bulking, I've been going on about bulking for, what, well, since 95, 98? Um, and I've been a sort of a lone voice going, yeah, try bulking first, try bulking. Um, and everyone says, ah, oh, you're an idiot and it doesn't work. Um, and I think, you know, obviously tapes are easy, tapes have come, tapes are, you know, tapes have been hammered. I don't think tapes are wrong. I still think there's a place and I think they've probably been hammered too much. But I do think, especially with sort of Montgomery and things, we should be at least talking to patients about injections. And I think there's a, there's a possibility now that if you don't mention injections, put them in your notes, there's a case for being sued. I'll just put that out there. Um, so we have a run through injections, why I think we should be doing them more often. Um, and I think it's about judging the patient, isn't it? And being a good judge of people. I think I'm a good judge of people. I was at Waitrose yesterday, because I live in Ascot. We've only got Waitrose. Um, and, the, and the chap in front of me had his groceries on the conveyor belt. And I was watching, there was a bottle of wine, six eggs, pizza, some salad. And I said, excuse me, sir, don't mind me asking. I said, do you live on your own? He looked at his groceries and said, how can you tell that? I said, you're bloody ugly. Anyway. <laughs> so it's about knowing your patient and about choosing the right thing for the patient. So what do BAUS have to say? Well, BAUS do have a pamphlet and it's just been released and this pamphlet is now good for until 2020. Hands up if you're involved in this leaflet. It is shit, all right? <laughs> It is absolutely, if, if I gave to the patient, they would not choose it. Because if you look at the sort of figures you're, they're coming out with, look, rate of needing to do intermittent catheterization, you know, one in two. Where did that come from? And not only do you say that, you haven't said this may be self-limiting, which interestingly is what's said in the, uh, in the tape, in the tape uh, consent form. Where did that figure come from? And that, we're stuck with that for the next, you know, three years. Um, so, you know, this is the sort of thing we're, we're putting out with, and I think a lot of the stuff we've got from injections is very historical. And I think a lot of people tried injections, they did a few, they often did it in really crappy patients, got bad results and said, oh, that doesn't work. Whereas I, what I want to get to the end of here is say, if you choose your patients right, if you use it first line, you know, you're expecting better results, and we're not expecting one in two patients to do intermittent catheterization for the rest of their life, which may be suggested by this consent form. Um, so let's bear that in mind and see what we get, where we get to at the end. Because, you know, first of all, it's measuring success, isn't it? And measuring success in, in incontinence, you know, where do we start? Are we just talking about the patient and what they think? Are we talking about urodynamics? Are we talking about pad testing? I must say most of us in DGHs, you know, the patient comes in, how are you? If you're happy, if you don't want any other treatment, I'm happy too. And I think it's a question of looking at success and I think we can be hypercritical. I've been involved in a lot of my papers and a lot of other people's papers, and Julian's at the back, I was involved in a lot of his papers. You know, and exactly how we assess dryness in a lot of these tests is, is open to question, I, I would suggest. Um, so are we talking subjective? Are we talking objective? Are we talking quality of life? Um, are we talking about patient outcomes? I think all of these have a place, and I think whenever you're discussing you know, treat, treatments with patients, you've got to, you know, all be talking about the same thing and assessing in, in the same way. So we tend to use quality of life scales, but most, most of ours now in a busy practice is just how are you? If you're happy, and I do say, you know, if you're not happy, we can do more. You know, when I sit there with a the patient and say, these are your treatments, we will start gently, but if it doesn't work, there is more we can do. Um, and following out from there. So I think we have to be realistic about how, what we're doing, how we're assessing, and if we're comparing the same thing together. Because if we just talk about the, uh, the Warden Hilton paper on TVT and cold suspension, depending on how you assess this patient, you can say, oh, I've got an 85% success with this operation. You know, but if you really want to be strict, you know, you've got a 38% chance of success. So I think let's be honest about everything we do. And let's compare the things. And what we're, most of us are interested in is patient satisfaction, isn't it? You can go through all those other things. You can be King's Hospital and do urodynamics pre and post. But at the end of the day, most of us are interested. Are, is your patient happy at the end of it? Are you going to pass the friends and family test? Um, 
you know, multi, multi you know, center analysis of all the incontinence operations say similar sort of things. Dudley Robinson looked at, you know, what women want and what their expectations are. Um, and, you know, when you're sitting there, do they, are, they, are they expecting a complete cure? Are they expecting just to be a bit better? Um, are they expecting just, you know, for a slightly improved quality of life? Patient expectations, surprisingly, are not that high. You know, if we face it, most of our patients come to see us when they've had stress incontinence for 18 years. And it's only now the second child's gone to university, it's time to do something about it. So patient expectations are not that high. Um, and when you say to them, what sort of treatment would you be happy with? Most of them want just something small. They're happy, you know, with something, a smaller procedure. They accept a, a, a lower success rate, but they don't want the complications. So I think, you know, you've got to be bearing this in mind. And when you're consenting people properly now, you know, these are all aspects of what you should be discussing. And if you're not discussing it, and if you're not documenting it, you know, I think you are opening yourself up for you know, potential problems. Uh, you know, and actually, as clinicians, what are we expecting? Are you expecting to say to your patient, you'll be 100% dry? You know, even the ones that come in and say, I'm great. You say, you're still wearing a pad? Oh, just for, just for protection. I've done it for 20 years. Um, so I think most of us are saying, We're just gonna, we want to improve your quality of life. You know, but unless we remove both kidneys, we don't think you're going to be completely dry all of the time. Um, so let's go on to urethral bulking, because we've done bariatrics, we've done bendy, so we're on bulking um, as a theme. You all know what uh, urethral bulking is, and if we go through the history of these things, and, you know, and I've been involved, so where, where do we start? I start with Julian with sort of contagen and macroplastic back in the sort of mid-90s. Obviously, I did a lot with Zuodex and Deflux, um, and you know, now we're on to Bulkamed and the Dexal, and there's you know, several new ones. And I think some of them have come and gone, you know, quite rightly gone, because they were disastrous. Um, but, you know, we've been trying this for a long time, but it's never really got the traction. You know, I think it's just starting to get now because, as we've said all morning, you know, there is a lot more worry. And the patients, even, you know, even when they don't know much about it, they go, oh, I don't want to tape. I don't want to tape. I haven't got six weeks to give you, you know. What can you do? And I'm too lazy and fat to do, you know, pelvic floor exercises. Um, so I think all these have to be taken in, into account. Um, you know, what is the optimum bulking agent? I think we can all agree, you know, it's biocompatible, it's not gonna cause a response, it's gonna stay in put for a long time. Um, it's not gonna queer the pitch for doing a bigger operation. You know, I think that's important. You know, you don't want it to stop you doing the bigger things. And certainly, you know, when you use a lot of macroplastic, if you go back in to do tapes, certainly in the men afterwards, you know, there can be an issue with, with the, the amount of tissue, the amount of product left behind. So I think we can all be quite comfortable about uh, what we would all dream of as, a, as the ideal substance. And I think we are starting to get better and closer to what we think uh, the ideal substance is. Uh, two sorts of, sorts of uh, products, either you're doing the homogenous gels, you know, which the volume you put in is the volume that's gonna stay, or you're doing the particulate matter where the volume you put in, some of it's going to be reabsorbed um, and it's going to leave you uh, with maybe some inflammatory tissue afterwards. So there's two sorts of groups straight away uh, we're talking about. Going back historically, uh, well, a, use the macroplastic. As you know, on, on your ideal substance, this is not an easy one to inject. You know, if you do a list of these, you've got a handache by the end of it. Um, and you know, there's always the worry about macroplastic. I won't go through all of them. The Bulkamed, I think, is getting a lot more traction. It's been th it was been through a lot of different companies marketing it, and I think it, it did seem to struggle. But I think now it's starting to, you know, if you go around the room and around the country, I think a lot more people are using the Bulkamed now, and I think they've now got some longer-term results, which we can sort of talk about. And the Deflux, which was Zuodex and, you know, all those things before, you know, I I've got a long-term, you know, history of using, and certainly... You know, I've been banging on about that for a number of years as well. If we just look at some of our results from Reading, um, you know, if you look at, you know, if you're looking at the, you know, what is cured, what is improved, we can have that argument. But you know, the mild, moderate, even the severe cases. So we're talking about the bariatric patients with, you know, uh, you know, your urethra that's dropping down to their external, external, you know, vaginal entrance, and you're going, you know, this shouldn't really work, you know. But it's a very easy thing to do in that great big fat patient that you're trying not to do anything to. You can do it under local anesthetic. You know, what is there to lose? That's the question. Um, 
we then went on to look at, you know, we've been doing it so long, we, we published the, uh, or presented the 10-year data um, at the AUA last year looking at deflux because they said, well, the long-term, you know, one of the questions is, well, long-term results aren't so good. You know, it's like having your lips done, isn't it? You know, Tamsin has her lips done all the time, and they go up and down, um, and it doesn't last that long. But, you know, and they said the collagen didn't last, the, the you know, silicon didn't last, so we wanted to have a look at that um, to see what the long-term results were. And we looked at 150 patients that, on average, um, you know, had been almost nine years. And this is sort of results. So, you know, if you started dry, there's a 50% chance you're still dry at four and a half, five years. You know, so this is not a short-term effect. Yes, yeah, not a lifetime effect. This is with the, this is with the deflux at the time. Um, but it is something that once you do it, it's much longer than a lot of people have in their mind. Okay? And again, this is something that when you say to the ladies, okay, we can do this now, and if, we, if it lasts five years, we can repeat it. If, if it doesn't last, we can do something bigger. Um, so I think you know, that's one of the take-home messages, that if you do the injections, you know, there's a good chance they will last if they're working. And we look at some of the other products. If you go on to have further surgery, so eventually over that 10-year period, 42% went on to have bigger surgery. There was no problem with doing bigger surgery in this group. So if at this time you've only got two days to take off because the family is still young, why wouldn't you do this and, and delay things uh, for a number of years? Uh, looking at complications, look, acute urinary tension rate, 6%, lasting less than two weeks in everyone. Where's that Baus figure come from? One in, one in two, it says on the... We'll go back to it. we go back to it. Still too many. Um, and the pseudocysts with the deflux are there, so well, you know, and there's been a number of talks about that. Uh, so inclusion of, of ours, looking at 10 years, it's easy. You can do it under local anesthetic. You can do it in all patients, and if it works for them, it's going to last. Why wouldn't you offer this? If it, and if you need to go on to do the tapes, you've had that discussion... I think you'd be in a much more comfortable place uh, if something goes wrong. Looking at the bulk of med, because that's increasing traction, increasingly popular, and at the moment it's, it's trying to get through FDA approval at the moment, and so they're doing their North American studies. And again, looking at the difference between, you know, they're doing bulk of med and, and contagen, because obviously it's the only thing licensed in the US, but again, they're looking at 80% of patients come in saying, yeah, that, that's, that's enough. I don't want anything else doing. 80% is still giving decent figures. And, importantly, how long does it last? Bokema is now out to sort of five years plus on results. And there's several studies now saying if it works in, at the, initially, that effect persists. Not, you know, and there's not just one paper on that. Uh, the Germans have similar sort of numbers um, and this is lots of centers doing the same thing. So it's not just one surgeon saying, these are my results, and I'm doing so many of them, I'm getting better results. I think it's a group doing, uh, doing enough. You know, I still think there's a learning curve, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but still saying, going out for five, seven years, the results last over that length of time. So going back to answering some of our injection questions, you know, does it last? Yes. Does it cause complications? Very little. Um, Again, so this is, this is how long it lasts, and this, and this is sort of the uh, visual analog sc scores and quality of life. Again, out five, five years. So I think the data is starting to get there um, to back up the idea that injections should be reached for a lot more often than they are. Looking at is it still in place, is a scan done eight years following bulk med deposits showing the product still in place. And then there's the learning curve. The trouble with the injections is that most urologists, not so much gynecologists, because they're shit surgeons generally, so they accept they can't learn things very quickly. Um, but urologists have a look at one and think, I can do that, that'd be all right. Uh, I don't need to learn that. we do a couple and they'll be fine. But there is a learning curve. Like there's a learning curve, it's a very short learning curve, but it's definitely there. Um, lovely presentation at Iuga, um, in 2015, looking at that learning curve. So it compares the consultant doing it, and his registrar having a go. And I think we'd all say, you know, that's probably an extreme case of, of learning curve, but quite a good way uh, to look at it. And looking at the difference between success rates of the new user, so someone hasn't really done it very often, 
looking in the order of 50%. And someone who's done sort of 20 plus, it will give you results in the order of 80%. And I think a lot of people try a few injections, and they get 50% and they go, nah, you know, and don't push on to do some more um, to get you know, the results you'd get. And we'd accept there's a learning curve for every other procedure, but I think because we think well, it's a cystoscopy, shouldn't be too difficult, not much of a learning curve, we don't really take, take that into account. And looking at the sort of the re-injection rate between, the, say, the, uh, the, the trainee um, and, and the consultant, again, big. Okay, you could say, ooh, and you've all got trainees like that. Are my trainees in the room? I won't say any, no jokes, no trainee jokes, okay. Um, so I think, you know, this is a great paper to say, yes, there is a learning curve, and if you're gonna do this, you know, do 10, do 20, before you judge yourself and judge your patients and judge this as whether this is a useful treatment in your armamentarium to treat these patients. So I think we've said there's a learning curve, you know, the success rates now, we've got follow-up out to eight years, uh, five, eight years, all of them saying, you know, if it's gonna work, it will keep working. It doesn't work in everyone, we we'll accept that. Um, but you have patients that don't want another treatment quite a long way out. Uh, and safety path for the bulk of med, again, you know, acute retention and ISC rates generally in the order of 1%. There's one, one paper which's slightly higher. But again, very short term, very short lived. Um, and really nothing else of note in the, uh, in the complication and side effect profile. Um, we did a paper looking at putting tapes in after the, uh, after the injections and again, there's no problem. There's no issue with putting tapes in after certainly several of the injections. I haven't done all of them, um, but certainly the deflux of Dexel, um, the Bulkmans now are all showing um, there's no problem with this. So if you haven't queered the pitch for doing something a bit larger. So I think, you know, in conclusion, I would, you know, I want to take a message to be, have another think about injections. I think as tra your trainees, I think we should have a certain, you know, that injections should be something they've done 20 of, or we can talk about, you know, numbers, um, to make sure they're, they're comfortable with it, because this should be on the consent form for the patients having stress incontinence. I think it's almost indefensible now, we can argue about that, if, if you don't, put it at least on there that you've discussed it. Um, because you know, what else are the options at the moment? The options at the moment are, you know, long, complicated conversations. Um, or bigger operations with a much longer recovery period. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's it. Are there any questions in the audience? Um, let's jump in. Hi, Steve. Uh, I'm Vipash Mishra. I have seen uh, a couple of um, eroded uh, bulking agents at the bladder neck, we all have. Yeah. Uh, so what is the best management for that? It's not very easy to resect. Um, and the other question was, I, I, I suspect we inject these things around the bladder neck in females. Yeah. Um, given the media coverage on um, mid-urethral tapes, if they later on, if it does not work and they go on to choose um, a, an autologous fascial sling which should be put uh, under the bladder neck, how easy or difficult will that be in that patient okay. who has uh, had a bulking agent? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think going to your first, a number of the, pro number of the products I, d I mentioned have come and gone. The Tegress and some of those other ones did leave quite large, almost stones, didn't they, around the bladder neck. And I think you know, they are hard to remove. I, I haven't got much experience in doing those myself, so I can't. There might be some others around here that tried more of that product. As far as the sort of the hydro, the sort of Dexel, the the, the uh, Zuidex type products, all they cause is a little pseudocyst which can be easily aspirated rather than cut out. So they're not an issue. I think the Bulkamed, again, if you inject it too superficially, it does form a bulge. You see it, and it sort of loses that vascularity and does um, leave leave a little ulcer in the in the way. Um, but it doesn't see, you know what it causes is failure of the injection because you've injected it too superficially, but doesn't cause any long-term complications. As far as the tapes are concerned, certainly with those couple of products I talked about, I've more experience of, absolutely no problem in mid urethral tapes going in afterwards. Even if, even in some of the girls that had had a deflux or, or zoodex and had the, these little pseudocysts, 
you know, when you first do it and you cut into it, you see a bit of this fluid and it looks a bit like pus, to be honest. And the first, two, the first couple you do, you take a swab and you send it off and you close them up again. It's always a sterile abscess. And subsequently, you know, if I did uncover any fluid when I was doing it, it didn't stop me putting the tape in and we had no complications related to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Roland, uh, please. Steve, uh, very nicely presented. I'm going to be a bit of a devil's advocate. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Now, I've got two things to you. The first thing is, is we know that bulking is not as successful as other procedures, but it does work in some. You presented the data in those where it was successful and that it survives over a period of time. If, if I was a health economist, I'd be saying, what is the benefit per pound spent right. on bulking? Because there is no evidence out there to suggest that the amount of money bulking agents cost compared to the success of actually putting it in and using it over a period of time is beneficial compared to the other treatments. So that's the first one. The second one is one of training. You've mentioned a huge difference between those who are learning and those who are experienced at it. You know, we shouldn't be practicing bulking on patients. We should actually be learning it in a simulated atmosphere. So they're my two questions to you. Okay, uh, so going back to your health economics one, I think we haven't got much health, health economics on many things we do. I think your argument could be, if you do an injection, the ladies are back at work day two. If someone is good doing injections, and they talk about 75% chance of success, compared to what, 85 if you do a tape, but you're gonna have six weeks off. On health economics of the whole economy, I think that would become you know, quite easy to argue. Um, as far as, you know, if you take the economics out and say, what would you, you want your wife to have? That could be a whole different argument. Um, and then going to the sort of the training model, I'm putting that up as just a good example of naive, you know, new people and, and, um, and consultants doing it. I'm not putting it up as this is the best way to train people. Okay, thank you. Uh, Richard. Uh -huh. um, well, uh, yeah, just to echo that really, my personal experience is, this is really easy, you just do some injections, what could possibly go wrong? And the answer is, it just doesn't work very well. And, it's, and it isn't particularly difficult to do, but there, are, there is certainly a knack to it, isn't there? I, mean, I think there's certainly a learning curve, and I think it's only a learning curve of about 20 if you're yeah. a half-decent surgeon. Um, but I think you're getting the depth right, getting the position right, um, you know, will increase your results from that 50% to the 75% we're seeing. And if you can give someone 75% for five years, compare it to, if you want to say 85, 90% if you want for a tape, I think it becomes more of a, a closer argument. And if you can do it in clinic under local anaesthetic, it becomes an even better argument. Yes, and I think the problem is if you try and do it as something that you do very occasionally, you know, I do this two or three times a year, you'll, on, know, you'll never on, get any good On the death. worst case patients. Yeah, if you do it a bit more regularly and you, and you, you get a larger number in a short length of time, then the, the, you're accelerating on that curve. So. Thank you. Uh, any more questions, please? From the audience, um, Steve, I have a question. Um, now that we're talking about bulking agents more and more, there is now a debate about be being first line treatment. Yeah. What do you think uh, are the best patient groups in whom you would consider uh, it as a first line? I mean, I think certainly it's first line if you haven't finished your family. You know, if you're only fit enough to have a local anaesthetic, you can argue whether you want to do your tape that way. Um, if you've failed a tape already and you're thinking of doing something more complicated, these are all a group where I think it would definitely be first line. Uh, and I think then you get into the have you got six weeks to take off argument. And certainly in, in the working population, the self-employed for sure, you know, don't want to take two days off. If you're employed by the NHS, yeah, great, have two months, you know, that's fine, health economic wise. I, you know, for me, it's been first line for years. Um, you know, so some people say, I say, these are the results. You know, I say if we, if we put a tape in, it's 85, 90% chance, and you know, it's going to last 10 years before it starts to tighten up and cause you UTIs. Um, but uh, I think there's certainly a definite group where you'd want to go that way. Thank you. Any more questions, please? Um, thank you. Um, so just to wrap up the session for this afternoon before uh, Thompson and Chris uh, are going to be uh, talking about future FNNU. I would like to thank um, our speakers, um, Ian Eardley, uh, who talked about a very important uh, subject on 
obesity, uh, something that we are dealing increasingly often in our clinics. Um, Mr. Vic Kula, uh, who was talking about um, ehlers Danlos syndrome, uh, again, something that uh, is increasingly recognized and probably underdiagnosed uh, problem. Um, and of course, Steve Foley uh, for an excellent uh, talk uh, on bulking agents. Thank you. Okay, so just before we go and join with the andrology section, we're going to talk a little bit about what's going to happen in the future with regards to FNUU, and it's not the subspeciality, it's the subsection group. And we really want this to be largely um, audience-driven, so I'm going to go through my slides really very quickly and hopefully bring up three things that I'd like to talk about. The three main topics that I think... Uh, are important is a, a, probably a continuation of the discussion that was started this morning following uh, Sophia and Nikesh's presentation on the stress urinary incontinence audit. We'll talk a little bit about the patient information leaflets, which have very recently been scrutinized, and also a little bit at the end about FNUU training and how we're going to recruit into the, the subspeciality in the future. So with regards to the audit, BAUS has a name, which is to create an evidence base through audit and data gathering to drive quality improvement in urology. And again, in line with most of BAUS's aims, they're looking to try and achieve this by 2020. We have a critical review of all BAUS audits, which is imminent. So your views today are essential. I will take those forward uh, and represent the subsection um, but at this, uh, this audit review. So what have we got? Well, as Nikesh and Sophia showed us this morning, we've got three consecutive years of published data, which makes it a really very big series and useful data. Almost 3,000 procedures, about 100 consultants from 82 centers, roughly four to one primary uh, recurrent surgery. The website's really good. It's patient-facing. It links to patient information leaflets, hospital data. You can drill down to individual consultants' data. And very, very shortly, we're going on to NHS choices where the surgeon volume and results from the proms will be available for all to see. The problem is we've got a, a fairly low data capture rate. So you compare it with HES figures, and we're roughly capturing just over 70%. And 63% of our cases have got follow-up data included, which equates to about 45% of all of the data if, if HES figures are used. And as you can see, gynecologists are doing the vast, vast majority of stress incontinence procedures. Uh, but it, when you look at their um, audit system via BSUG, the, the capture rate's less than 40%, as Nikesh pointed out this morning. So the problems are that it's surgeon-entered data, which has got a significant risk of bias. You know, it relies on us to enter all our data in an accurate way, uh, and it's easy to, to lose the odd case. So... You know, significant bias, this is not high-level evidence. The data capture rate is slightly disappointing, but we're going to do some work to try and improve that. Um, and there obviously are some surgeons and some units that don't enter any data, and, and this is quite an expensive process. So I think what I'd quite like to do now is open it up to the floor and just continue the discussion that we had this morning with regards to ways to improve the... The, um, the SUI audit, if any. Now, just bear in mind that I will be asking you this question at the end of our two or three minutes discussion. Would anyone like to make any points? Harry, would you like to make a point about the SUI audit data? But you hadn't actually entered no. any data before, had you? Yeah, no, I've been doing this process for years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so what were the reasons why you didn't? I'm not, I'm just, just Harry came and talked to me, so I'm not particularly picking on him. I just, uh, I thought it was great that you joined in for the first time, and I just wondered what were the things that stopped you entering before, and what made you start now? When, when the format of the database changed, that's when I um, slipped, because I got used to entering it. Uh, in its original format, and then when it changed, I never really got round to working out how to do it. Um, but now I'm up to speed with it. It, you know, it takes five minutes to do. 
um, but I did have quite a backlog to catch up with. And, and I know everyone says I have to enter this data myself and it's a tremendous pain, but the median number of procedures done by a urologist in the UK is nine. Uh, it can't really take that long. Yeah, just, are there any other reasons? Uh, guys who are entering, who are not entering, what, what are your reasons for doing both? Rizwan. Because you look happy. If you give the gentleman with the white hair. No, I think probably I get the registrar to do them and we do it uh, at the same time. Uh, I, no, I, I think it's a collab collab collaborative thing and we, it works very well. So just while the mic's making its way to Magda, we can be thinking about why do you think our follow-up rate is so poor? Just have a think about that. Um, I'd like just to comment from Richard Parkinson's comment this morning talking about consent. If we're concerned about um, the, the, the comeback we, we are expecting in England, particularly having had the Scottish experience, you're only um, cementing your own practice if you are entering patients onto this database. It's a bit of an insurance policy, if you like, just again as evidence that you're practicing well. Vivash, do you enter data? I have been a um, late catcher up all my life. Uh, so similarly, <laughs> similarly with this also, um, I always tend to have a backlog. And I think um, the the only difference between me and majority of us is I, I admit that I am chaotic. Um, whereas, and and we allow a backlog to develop. I think that is where the inertia sets in. So if we just uh, kept going case by case. As you said, it hardly takes any time, provided we, we just uh, go along as we are doing the cases, don't allow a backlog to. And for that to happen, I think uh, uh, obtaining consent uh, months before or at the time of uh, booking the patient, similarly entering these data, we have to manage our clinic numbers and theater numbers, list uh, uh, numbers on the lists um, uh, more practically okay. and more stringently. Hi, it's Mary Bilal. Um, I'm very fortunate in that I have someone who actually enters the data. We have a clerk who does it for all the BAFs things. The big issue I have is actually the follow-up data. And the reason is that the patients end up in multiple different clinics seen by different people. And it's actually very hard sometimes to keep track of that on, on a sort of practical level. So inputting the data is not the problem. It's actually chasing the follow-up data, which is proven to be more difficult. So I'll be happy to hear how everyone else does the follow-up data, which is what I'm struggling with. So I have blank questionnaires in the clinics that I do. Um, so even if I'm not there, they'll be given out when the tape patients come back. But as Tamsin says, we're not talking about enormous numbers here with a median surgeon number of nine in the UK. So, you know, even with backlogs, they, they can only be so big. Mr. Parkinson? I, th I think you can do it. It's better to do it as you go along. Yeah much better and it takes just a couple of minutes but it takes much longer having to dig out the notes and find out and the and the, I mean the, so just a slight thing that maybe we have to talk this one out is to say what are we doing it for what are we actually going to use the data for because I think that's the question isn't it how are we going to use it moving forward what's the point what, what's the point and we've yeah. got to well, come up with a what's the point effect, what I'm asking. Aaron Sahai has yeah. got his hand up as well and then Mrs Van Susie Van I just want to say I think it's really really important that the consultants take ownership of this so I know I've heard some comments about registrars and other people but this is important data it's your data if you're going to get registrars there that's fine as long as you're checking it over but I think it needs to be consultant led it's a proper audit from our you know, national organization. So I, I feel strongly that it's gonna be consultant-led, consultant-driven. I'm not saying- I, feel, I, I, I completely disagree with that because I think in order to get an unbiased data entry, it has to not be inputted by us. It has to be put in by someone else. And if it's your registrar who is just gonna put in what the patient says, then that's probably a, a less biased audit. Well, unless you're, as long as you're getting full accurate data sets then. I mean, I don't know. I, mean, I agree not... that, that consultants must take responsibility for the data going in. I absolutely agree with that. But I can see Tamsin's point yeah, about get... external validation. Can I ask you a question, Chris? Yeah. Chris, why are, the why are urogynecologists not having to do it? 
I don't know the answer to that. Okay. It was a question I was going to ask Nikesh this morning, but I didn't what? get... I, I just... Which is bizarre. Yeah, they um, didn't the thing is that sign I, up to the I entered my data on, on an iPad at the time, and I would just re recommend it to all of you. It's so easy. Yeah. There's networks everywhere now. And I agree, there's not m much data, but there's also that you read the Plasty database, there's the, this database, there's all sorts of things. So anything that makes life easier, yeah. Try but when you look at the when really you look easy. at the response rate for on the BSOG database, there'll be a few nervous gynaecologists in the next two or three years, won't they, with all of the tape cases coming to court? You know, where can they demonstrate that they contribute to national audit? And uh, you know, the the majority of us are doing that. Ian, hi, Chris. Um, yeah. It's going back to this morning, isn't it? We're going to steal a march on the BSUG database by putting in our follow-up data. You know, we do the minority of the procedures, but we have a chance to have the majority of the follow-up because of the very nature of their database. So I would say, going back to Richard's comment, why are we doing this? We're, we're, we're doing this to show... At the moment, we've only got three months follow-up, and I think we need to change what we're doing to extend so that we have year follow-up, five-year follow-up, ten-year follow-up, and then we would actually have very useful data, but it's just set up by BAUS at the moment for three months' data. So I mean, we I have been exploring our own databases to keep our own long-term results as a group with Richard I think Parkinson that fr here. from the NHS England MESH review, that was the thing that was really lacking in the literature, and we couldn't find it when we went and looked, which was long-term data, and we're building up a cohort that we can actually at some point collect long-term data on if necessary. So I think we'll... we'll Roland, Roland's at the oh, back, and Roland. I feel like I've ignored him long enough. You have, quite right. You're very far I away, I mean, Chris, Chris has basically said what I was Thank thinking. you, Roland. Next. <laughs> Chris has said what I was going to say. But the NHS England review, which comes out in a month's time, will actually say that we want long-term follow-up. So what we've got to do is push NHS England to actually pay for that. Okay, so why don't we take out our mobile phones? And if apparently if I press the green button, you can vote on this now. So you, the, the question is, what should we do with the SUI audit? Uh, should we continue in its current format? Should we push as a group for a registry, which could be industry funded? Should we keep our own individual data and save Bows some money or other? And if you vote other, you'll be asked to expand on that. So vote now. Oh, where's the music? I had music in it. And the availability of scan. <laughs> okay, so we're split between continuing as we are and asking for a registry. So, oh, hang on. No, no, we're, we're, we're. So I shall take these data to the to the audit review that Baus are going to comment. Um, Can we tell how many people have voted? We can get, yeah, so there you go. Eight, so there's going to be about 20 maybe. Oh, come on, there's more than 20 people in here. Vote. <laughs> so not only can... Mr Foley can't read patient information leaflets accurately and he can't get the app downloaded. So in the interest of uh, moving on, if you've got any strong views that you want me to take forward on your behalf, then I'm more than happy to do so. So the next thing is the patient information leaflets that perhaps people will have some views on. We significantly overhauled this um, uh, last year and the early part of this year, and, and specific thanks to Mary Garthwaite and Richard Parkinson and Sheila and Sophia Cashman and everyone who was really involved on the committee uh, we cons uh, consulted the Plain English Campaign and the Patient Information Forum, and we've now got patient information leaflets for about 40 different procedures. We believe that patients should be receiving consistent information. Uh, you know, so no matter whether they're coming to my clinic in Newcastle or Tamsin's in London, they should be getting consistent information. And that's one of the things that the whole MESH review has, has brought out, the consistency of patient counselling. So I'm just going to take you through something that we probably all do, which is intravascular botulinum toxin injections. And as you can see, most of the guidelines summarise key points at the start. So there's a box there looking at, you know, what Botox is for, uh, where you'll have it done, what the possible side effects can be, and the need for repeat uh, 
procedures are commented on. And these are the subheadings, and that's common throughout all of the BAUS PILs in terms of, uh, you know, specific questions patient might, uh, patients may ask, and it's covered really well. I think the Botox one's a particularly good one. And then they quantify the side effects with these uh, traffic light stroke battery systems, which uh, we didn't all agree with, but we went with on advice. So looking at the side effects of Botox, you know, you can see them, one of the most common is that your symptoms will return, a bit of mild stinging or burning, bleeding, all the way through to rare things such as generalized weakness or an allergic reaction. And, you know, this is vi good visual and, um, and verbal information with regards to the uh, procedure that the patient can expect to undertake. So the discussion is that, you know, are we as a subsection uh, going to recommend that these patient information leaflets are adopted by all of us in our clinics and used as the primary source of information with a specific aim of ensuring consistency of information delivered to our patients. And you will be voting on this in a second. Get your apps ready. Anyone like to make any points regarding the patient information leaflets? Mary. Um, people should be aware that it will say on the site that you don't... One option is that you don't actually use the BAUS form, you can take bits out of it and as a member through the login area you have access to information leaflets in word format so that you can copy sections of it into your own local um, information leaflets but you are asked if you would kindly at least uh, recognise that it is from BAUS on the BAUS website, um, the BAUS information leaflet. Nikesh. Thanks. It's just another body of work I was thinking about from this morning's uh, discussions with Richard and medical legal. Clearly, the medical legal experts can't agree and quite obviously generate income for themselves from that. But can you get a medical legal sign-off so all the medical legal bodies get together and say, well, actually, this is what the risks are for this procedure. So for superior catheter, you put in death or you don't put in death. And that's the agreement that you don't then come back to later in a, in a court. The law, the, our, our courts of law can't agree because that's why they keep going to the Court of Appeal and things get changed. So having one lawyer say, this is fine, doesn't mean that someone else well, will exactly. think it's so fine. Well, exactly. I'd agree that you wouldn't have one lawyer. You'd get all the guys that do medical legal work in the UK for urology and they go through them and they sign it off. Ian, what do you think with your college hat on? Microphone's coming. The, the, the consent forms, I think, are fine. I, I think they're beautiful, actually. They're, lot, they're, a, they're an upgrade on the last lot, which were good, and these are very good. Uh, but the problem is simply because you've given it to the patient, it's not proof of consent in terms of Montgomery. It doesn't actually prove that the patient's understood what's in it, and that's the challenge. So simply getting a list of acceptable side effects will not solve the problem. If this is meant to sort of augment your interaction, and so the, the, the consent starts off, so you, you see the patient in clinic, you give them the information leaflets, you either sign the consent form and, re, and reconfirm on the telephone or at another clinic. I think in, in Glasgow, you've got a consent clinic, haven't you? If you, um, the gentleman with the beard, if you take him a, which is like half the room, sorry. <laughs> I think it's just designed to augment and say that we all consistently give the same patient information. I think that's quite a nice idea. I mean, we're obliged to use this. If, we're, if the patient's having a tape, there is a Scottish NHS tape thing that we have to use as well. Uh, yeah. But that does, there's no reason you can't also use the BOUS information uh, leaflets, and I do use them, and I think the, the new ones are really good. But I'm entirely in agreement with Ian that just simply giving patients information leaflets is, is not proof of consent. And I... Uh, I put up the sort of shared information table concept this morning, which uh, Will Agar and Ayer has been very keen on. I think that's a, a really good way of doing it. You get the patient to write in the boxes why they're having one operation, why they don't want another operation, get them to sign it, and that's proper consent. And I think we'll stand, that'll stand up pretty well in court. Roland, I won't ignore you. Go on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. I mean, just following on what Mike has said, from a medico-legal point of view, 
the information sheets are very important and the lawyers will support us because it is a national body that has brought these up. But you have to prove in your notes that you have done proper informed consent. And that relies on you ensuring that the patients have asked the appropriate questions and that they have understood. And providing you have done that, your lawyers will support you. Okay, so we're going to take it to a vote now. Are, how many of us are willing to use the BAUS patient information leaflets as they are in the overhauled versions as their main source of clinic information? All vote now. So we do have comparative patient information leaflets on stress incontinence and overactivity on the website, but we don't have that homework sheet that your colleague puts in. I mean, that's something we so, could yeah, consider. Definitely. Okay, so I, I know I'm overrunning, so we'll move on quite quickly now. Um, so training and recruitment, we, prob we are competing with the robots, although I'm sure functional reconstructive urology will move into the robotic era fairly soon. Uh, in the subsection, we've created a training and education executive. There are four of us that sit on it. And we've also compiled a list of the courses, the training events, and they're all on the website. We're taking FNU uh, around the region. So we had the Cambridge meeting last year. Tamsin's incorporating this year's meeting with a master class, and then I'm going to do something in Newcastle next year. So there's no vote for this one, but just for the last two minutes of the session, can we just think about, firstly, how can we attract high-caliber medical students and FYs into FNUU, or how we can attract uh, urology specialty trainees into, into the subspeciality, and thirdly, how we can improve the training of the existing STs who uh, you know, may have already chosen FNUU as a potential subspeciality. So a few things to think about. We'll have a couple of minutes to discussion, and then we'll draw it to a close. So, Victor Nitti, are you going to join FNU? Well, I can, for this particular topic, I can actually tell you some of the experience we had in the United States because we spent a great deal of time, effort, and money on this very topic. Now, the U.S. is a bit different in that we can train an FPMRS, which is a board-certified board certificate, and you can do it as a urologist or you can do it as a gynecologist. Um, and the fellowships have the same, essentially the same requirements, except it's two years for a uro urologist and three for a gynecologist. Um, but we saw in urology, we, we, we didn't think we were attracting the best people into the field. And some years we weren't actual, we just barely had enough of people applying to our fellowships. So we put a great deal of effort into getting the word out about the specialty and all of the things that we thought were so great about it, whether it be female pelvic medicine, neurourology, um, lower urinary tract dysfunction. Uh, so every year we have a resident conference, and it's, uh, residents from all programs are invited. We get about 70 a year. We paid for that entire program with the exception of getting the people there. We pay for the hotel, the meals, and the whole program. It worked. We started to see our numbers going up. We started to see better education more programs hiring FPMRS faculty. Um, but it took, it, and we spent a lot of resources. And SUFU is not part of the AUA. It's an independent organization. So we spent a good deal of, of our resources on that. We also have a preceptorship program where residents can apply. And they can, uh, if they come, they write an essay. And if they come from a program that doesn't have a lot of FPMRS, they can be chosen to go and spend a week in a program that does have that. And again, SUFU pays for that. So it was a decision by our organization to spend a lot of our resources on that education. We spend less resources on some of the other things that, that you've done, although you are supported by the parent organization where we are not. But there, there are things you can do, but it takes you know, effort. And will trainees come? Or will program send their trainees if they have to pay for it? I don't know, but we made it free and we got an excellent response. And uh, it has, I think, served its purpose up until now. It probably took about three or four years uh, before we really uh, were able to reap the, uh, the fruits of, of that effort. Susie. Thank you. 
Um, thank you. I think Nikesh tried to emulate that a little with the last Cambridge course. We offered free places to attend our um, section meeting to trainees um, and tried to provide that. So I think we're making the right headway. Uh, we've now got um, leads for the medical students, and that's Toby, isn't it, and for the core trainees, Dominic, and I wonder if we should be infiltrating those meetings. I know, Tamsin, you're going to do a talk, aren't you, today, in Dominic's session on core, tra uh, core trainees, or tomorrow. It's on the programme. Well, you're going to talk to them about how great the female is. It's, it's in ten minutes, are you yeah. ready? <laughs> but, um, I haven't written it yet. <laughs> I think you, you both touched on it. You didn't. Call, you just earlier referred to it as female and functional reconstructive urology, and Tamsin, you know, we talked about not knowing what FNUU meant this morning. Do you think the title, female... You know, your neuro urology and neurodynamics is just putting people off because I say uh, it, it just it makes would put you me think off. of pads and, and tapes. Yeah, so that's the problem. It doesn't show the wide breadth that most of the people in this room, you know, room yeah, do, I including male incontinence, male LUTs, reconstruction, the fancy stuff with Metrophonos, which is really the you know interesting, exciting. Should we be calling it female urology and reconstructive surgery? So we should I, be saying. I can see Mabel Al sticking his hand up. Is that? But can we have some trainees stand up and and tell us why? And why not? They think why well, they want to do FNU because they're in the room. They're looking at Rachel and Sophia, and why they their colleagues may not want to do FNU. And anyone else who's a trainee? Um, so I think with regards to medical students and FYs, it's purely a lack of exposure to urology generally. I know I didn't get very much when I was a medical yeah, I student agree. in FYs. So we need to kind of encourage that from a kind of base level. Uh, but in terms of wanting to do FNUU, I think there's a misconception about what it is amongst trainees. When I tell people I want to do female and reconstruction, they go, you know, why don't you want to put up with moaning women all day? That's not all it is, but that's the conception. I've you know, that's what people think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another trainee? Well, yeah. Anyone? But, um, yeah, okay, we've got a hand up there. You're not a trainee, Mo. <laughs> Thank you. I think part of the problem is that people tend to decide their subspec earlier on in their training, so ST345, which is when you tend to do your DGH years, and there's just not the exposure in a lot of DGHs um, to any experience in um, neuropaths, reconstruction, and female urology in a lot of these units. It's predominantly done by gynaecologists. And there may or may not be the relationship to allow you to get exposure to that. So exposure is the common theme. John Barclay, we're going to give the last word, and then I have to let you have a break before we go in, into the Lomond suite for the God, the pressure. Session. Um, right, John. Yeah, I think exactly the same thing. I think it's due to uh, lack of availability of training with you consultants. So if you don't work in a centre which offers uh, this specialty, uh, you get lots of... The uh, other consultants, basically, anything comes into clinic and they're like, all right, send it to functional. Yeah, send it to functional. And if you don't get first-person exposure to the specialty, which is difficult, um, then you never get to see the breadth of it, really. That's brilliant. So exposure, the common theme, last last word. Uh, just just a quick um, uh, uh, comment. I wasn't training a long time. I was training a not long time ago myself. I, um, one of the issues is a lack of peri-city uh, fellowships um, <clears throat> where, which are recognized uh, peri-city fellowships. I have, I have been asked on numerous occasions by trainees uh, in the middle uh, or at the very latter stages of their training uh, where I can go uh, to get some more experience. And I think uh, with a uh, recent Royal College uh, work uh, on uh, getting it more formalised, I think that should I think get that, better. That's a very good point. We've just had our fellowship in Newcastle badged, and uh, we're going to, as a as a subspecialty, try and, and increase the numbers of Perry CCT fellowships that are available. I've got to draw it to a close there. So just to say thanks to all of the speakers, the committee for organising. I think it's been a brilliant. Um, functional meeting as it always is well attended but I would encourage you to finish off the day with a, a joint session with the andrologists in the Lomond Hall in about three seconds time thank you very much <laughs>